Today, Voices from Oxford is talking to the head of a very famous department in the science area of the university because the Dunn School of Pathology, which is where we are at the moment, was actually the department where penicillin was first used in clinical application and therefore to save very, very many lives indeed in the course of its use. Now, the head of that department now is a man called uh, Matthew Freeman, who came to this university. I think you came from Cambridge. Uh, I came from Cambridge. I came from the MRC. I wasn't actually part of Cambridge University. Yeah, you came from the area of Cambridge. I came, from, I, I came from the <laughs> geographical region of another place. To cross over to <laughs> Oxford yeah. uh, a few years ago. How do you like being head of the pathology department? <laughs> Oh, it's fantastic. It's a very special place. As you said, the Dunn School is where penicillin was developed as a drug, and then the first clinical trials came out of here, and within a small number of years, they were producing enough penicillin to treat all the Allied troops during the Second World War. And so that's an incredible history. And the discovery of penicillin keeps being voted as being the greatest medical discovery of the 20th century or of all times or whatever. Yeah. And if you think about the number of lives saved, um, it probably is. We don't actually have a good number, but it's a very large number, hundreds of millions probably over the years. And so that's an incredible privilege to come and be head of, head of that department. And in fact, this office we're sitting in, this is Flory's office. Flory was the person who developed um, Fleming's original observation into a usable drug, and that was done out of this office. And so I really feel like a bit like the sort of keeper of the eternal flame. And it, so it's a great privilege. And the Dunn School is a very special place. Um, we do a we do a very broad spectrum of medical research, and yes. I'm uh, very excited to be the head of it. So, what do you see as the focus of the department's uh, work now? I mean, is it uh, the heart of it? Would be what we go by the rather complex name of the Sir William. Dunn School of Pathology and that's not a great name because it doesn't tell anyone much about what we do. So we refer to ourselves as the Dunn School because that's easier and we've slightly avoid the term pathology because to be honest nobody knows really what pathology means. Um, in fact it sort of it suggests something to do with dead bodies or something to most people and it doesn't. When this department was founded about getting on for a hundred years ago um, I think they really meant by pathology medical research. And what this department has done from its founding all the way through now is quite a broad spectrum of medical research with a focus on the sort of fundamental biology that underpins disease. So you describe, would describe yourself as a cell biologist? Yes, that's, that's what I consider myself yeah. to be these okay. days. So what interests you in cell biology? The cell is the fundamental unit of life. So essentially, if you're trying to understand how life works or indeed how disease works, I mean, it's an oversimplification to say that you can boil it all down to understanding cells. But on the other hand, if you don't understand those basic building blocks, you probably can't understand it at the level you need to in order to either understand it with fundamental, at a fundamental level or to be able to think about how you would treat disease. And so I feel it's really important that we understand life and disease at the level of individual cells. And that's what my work is about. And in a way, you could argue that the last 50 or 60 years has been the period of molecular biology. So from the discovery of the double helix in the 1950s up until perhaps the Human Genome Project, publication of the Human Genome, that was the era of molecular biology. And I think in a way you could argue we're moving into the era of cells, which are massively more complex than the molecules, but nevertheless it's the sort of next level that you need to understand biology at. Yes, well just for the sake of our audience, yeah. many of which of course will not be scientists, if sure. we imagined a molecule about the size of my fist, yes the edge of the cell will be way up in Aberdeen. Yes, yes, the, the, the edge of the cell, I, I don't know it's Aberdeen or Whitney, but you know, it's a long way away. We're talking about a completely different scale. Exactly. I mean, the cells are tiny, you can only see them with microscopes, but they have extraordinary complexity in them. They not only hold your, all the genetic material, but they're also the factories that produce all the proteins. They also communicate with each other, which is what my science is about. They build up larger structures of many cells communicating with each other to make 
make organs, um, and then you go up into the levels of sort of systems and tissues, eventually whole bodies. Sure. And we have trillions of cells in our body, and they all have specialised jobs. And yet we start as a single cell, don't we? We start as a single cell. I started my life as a developmental biologist, not a cell biologist, and a developmental biologist really asks the question in one way or another, how do you move from being a single cell exactly. that we all start from to you or me with trillions of cells doing many different things? Yes. And I rather moved over my career from asking those questions about how we develop into actually wanting to understand the machinery of how we work and understanding that via cells. Now, cells, OK, we start as a cell, mm. but then it divides, doesn't it? Yeah. And are the cells talking to each other? Because earlier you said cell communication. So from the beginning, cells talk to each other, and the language they speak um, is, it turns out to be a, a common language across all cells, and the, what they're telling each other is what they should be doing. So a cell has choices to make. And it's a very small thing, but it still has choices. Should it divide or not divide? Um, should it become more specialized or should it stay as it is? Um, should it move or should it stay still? Should it die? All those sort of decisions that cells have to make as we develop and then as we function as human beings, um, the vast majority of those sort of decisions are made by cells communicating with each other. And my own research is based on trying to understand the sort of molecular and cellular machinery of how cells communicate with each other. So the language, the grammar, and how that language is then processed to make decisions in cells, if you want to use an analogy of language. If I, actually, if I took any old cell from my body yeah. and I took it and placed it somewhere else, yeah. It would get different signals. It would get different signals and it might well not thrive. It might die because it gets the wrong signals. And when you come to think about disease, um, as we do in the Dunn School, um, if this signaling process goes wrong, that underpins many, many different kinds of disease. In a way, the simplest, most classic example would be to talk about cancer. So cancer is a disease primarily where cell division becomes unregulated. And there are many causes of that, but one of the very major causes of it is because those signals between cells which normally tell them when they should divide or when they should not divide, those signals become unregulated, and now cells just continue to divide. Instead but, of recognising, as it were, we've got big enough. Yeah, we've got big enough. We, we're not supposed to be dividing now. We should stop. They lose that control. But, I mean, that's only one of many different examples. You can talk about how cell communication is relevant to actually, you know, almost any disease yeah. fundamentally will depend at some level on cells communicating with each other. I indeed, yes. And so, in a way, what I think my science is, I don't work on a specific disease or even a specific disease area. I mean, if I want to sound a bit arrogant, I would say I work on all disease yes. because, in a way, this cellular communication underpins yes. everything. Yes. Um, and I think, actually, Within the Dunn School, there are people here who work on specific diseases. We have people here who work on infectious diseases. We have people uh, like uh, Flory back in those penicillin days. But we also have people who are working here on cancer and on other kinds of diseases. But actually what a lot of people do here is to work on those kind of basic cellular and molecular processes that underlie lots of different diseases. So to take up your joke earlier on that you're not sure what pathology is, yeah. <laughs> I could say you're just as much a physiologist as, as me. Yes, indeed. And actually, I think that leads us to a very interesting, a very interesting point, which is that these, um, these distinctions, these sort of names of what we all do, mean almost nothing. Exactly. I'm not sure they ever did, but even if they did at some point, they certainly don't do now. But that leads me to a, a very interesting question, which I'd like to put to you, Matthew, and that's mm. this. Uh, earlier on, we, we, we thought of the fact that a, a molecule, if it was this sort of size, would yeah. see the edge of the cell somewhere up in the edge of Scotland. Yeah. Uh, now, the complexity. Mm. It, it's, are we going to be able to deal with that? Is that a, well, how do you see this well, as a challenge? Essentially, I mean, I'm not sure a physiologist might see it differently, but I'm essentially a reductionist, and I think you yeah. can... I mean, you. There, are, there are, will always be sort of areas of complexity that you don't yet understand. I don't think there are any areas of complexity that we cannot understand. Indeed, I would agree with you. And, that. Yeah. and what we're trying to do is to, in a way, you know, we meet in the middle. 
a physiologist maybe starts at the systems, at the sort of complex systems, and is trying to move down to a sort of more fundamental understanding. And I think what we're doing is starting at the bottom and trying to build up. And what we hope is, is that we actually meet somewhere in the middle rather than missing each other. The question is, is that meeting going to happen in your my lifetime? Or? Well, I think it already is. I mean, I think actually what's really exciting, and one of the things that's excited me about moving to Oxford, is that the Dunn School is part of the South Parks Road Science Area. Area. Yes. And within a three or four hundred meters of here, we have not only physiology departments and biochemistry departments and pharmacology departments, but we also have chemistry departments and physics departments and engineering departments. And increasingly, the conversations that I'm involved with as a head of department here, when I go and talk to other heads of department, is how all of what we're doing is integrating into grand themes that emerge that no longer break down the lines of these individual departments. Indeed so, and yes. If Oxford, I mean, what Oxford is doing very successfully now, and I think it's giving anywhere in the world a run for its money on this, is learning how to integrate those different subspecialties into yes. addressing the big challenges. Yes. So I think already a physiology department and a biochemistry department and a pathology department are all largely interchangeable. Indeed. And I, there are people in your department who could easily work here and vice versa exactly. and true across many of the departments. Exactly so. So you see Oxford and indeed other universities too that their future is to sort of break down some of the artificial barriers and to recognize that interdisciplinarity is partly where it's at. Well, I think it's almost entirely where it's at. Yes. Um, I mean I think that even if you're working, I am, uh, my own cell biology is incredibly specialized and, you know, detailed and yes. not many people would be very interested in hearing the minutiae of it. Yeah. But the truth is I also depend on chemists and I depend on computational biology and I depend on people working on whole organisms. Um, and so, and that's just, you know, one example of my own science. And I think that is, you know, that's replicated many times across the whole science area. And I think what we now do is we recognize this and what we're trying to do is to build the infrastructure and the systems within the Oxford, the whole Oxford process that allows that science to happen in its most efficient way. Yeah. And I think that's working and I'm quite excited about it. Well, you're already answering my last question, uh -huh. uh, which is it working? Now, you would expect a university like Oxford to be almost how should I best put this? Almost ideal for that, because we all mix around amongst the faculties in a very interesting way, don't we? Yes. It, does that help us, do you think? Oh, I think it, I, unquestionably it does. Perhaps what you're partly referring to, of course, is what's unusual here is the college system. Exactly. So yes. if you and I go back to our colleges, we may well find ourselves talking to someone in a completely different discipline exactly. to us. Yes. Now, yes. if we're honest, Sometimes we're talking about the football or something. <laughs> Absolutely. Or the, but, tulips. Or, or the tulips or, you know, your garden or whatever it is. But, but also, sometimes, yes. you're talking about some very interesting thing that they're grappling with. Yes. And I, had a, I, I was having a conversation with someone recently, and it turned out that the, it was in a completely different field, but it turned out that thinking about it in the terms that an evolutionary biologist might think about it turned out to be a, a bit of an insight into what they were doing. Oh, so, yes, um, and yes. they were a social scientist working oh, on something completely different. And I said, you know what, that sounds basically what you're talking about is a sort of Darwinian natural yes. selection yes, process. Indeed, yes. And he said, I've never thought about it that way. Right. Now, I'm not, I'm not, I don't work on Darwinian natural selection, but as a biologist, I sort of know the basics. Know the basics. And, yes. and I was able to point out these parallels. Yes. And that's the sort of thing that is, I don't know whether that will inform or in any way th make him think differently about what he was doing but it was an it was a nice recent example of how yes. if you get to talk to people in other disciplines but at a more sort of specific level the fact that I talk spend a lot of time talking to people in the chemistry department or the physics department or the physiology department yeah. and having them all in in some ways what would be considered many places a slightly old-fashioned system of having everyone on a single campus here down in South Parks Road yeah. Um, or all the basic sciences, at least down here in South Parks Road. Yes. Actually, that gives us a huge edge, because really, it is all about proximity. If you only have to walk a couple of hundred yards to go and talk to yes. someone in a different area, it's very easy to do it. And I think that happens. And my own science is massively benefiting from collaborations in physiology, in biochemistry. And I, people, I and people in my lab, we spend a lot of time walking between these departments. Yes, indeed. And I think that's why it is working.
And as you said earlier on, Matthew, even across to the social sciences and the humanities, you yep. can find connection. You can. Yes. I suppose if you go back to the original concept of a university... But so what does it you, mean? Exactly. It is a sort of holistic concept. Is, and in a way, we've, be, we've perhaps yes. spent the last few hundred years being sort of atomized and separated into departments. Yes. And maybe the sort of grand cycle is changing a bit and we're, we're trying to sort of pull together a bit more. And that's, a, that's an exciting concept, I think. Exactly so, Matthew. Well, that's a very suitable point at which to finish this interview for Voices from Oxford. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed it. Thank you.